the, this evening's discussion um, is changing how we sit uh, meditation due to physical ailment. Um, and uh, I would, this is, this is a broad topic. Um, and however, I wanted to have something a little more practical for my discussion this evening. Um, and, and so I'll say, I'm not gonna cover specific ailments. I'm not going to tell you do this for knee pain, do that for back pain. I'm not going to provide medical advice or anything like that. Um, this is really trying to get a running nose. <laughs> shove a tissue halfway up. No, no. Right. There's just too many, there's too many things to cover in this short time. I mean, each ailment might have its own discussion in and of itself, but um, at least for this evening, um, uh, none of this is, I, I want to have a general conversation. Um, none of it is definitive. It's to give a, I want to paint a picture um, at least and in, in, in what is a meditation practice and why that is important. Um, and, and then how do we notice ailments as they arise because they inevitably will. Um, and then uh, how do we notice that, take stock of it, uh, assess it and make appropriate changes. Um, and uh, as part of it, I have to make the caveat to say, I'll, I'll probably say things like meditation practice, um, but as Munchin Sensei always likes to make the distinction in, in that in Buddhism, our practice is compassion. And meditation is the method, a method, by which we can cultivate and develop compassion. Right? So I may, but on the other hand, we need to practice meditation. So in the same way a doctor has a medical practice, they're continually learning. And so the, the, the evolution of their practice um, is constantly reevaluating itself. It does have to make changes. Um, nothing is static, remember? You know that whole dukkha stuff? Um, and so, so at least for a meditation practice, it, it's something that we have to work at. And so, it, as a concept, first and foremost, it means that you have to meditate. I mean, a meditation practice is predicated on an idea that you do it. So first and foremost, let's start there. Um, do your meditation. Uh, no, a, a meditation practice should, uh, should be daily. Um, it doesn't have to be. But well, what, I'll, what I hope to discuss is why, why a daily practice is important. Um, and in particular, around our topic this, uh, this evening, around um, discovering physical ailments or coping with physical ailments. Um, and um, as part of that, that as we, as we do a practice of meditation, finding our, uh, if, and if it is daily, finding our routine within it is really important. Um, so I will define a little bit about what that what that is, um, and then and, and what why that is really important um, a, a little later. Um, but <clears throat> there, having a practice uh, has its importance in so much as not only are having an accumulative process of um, learning how to best meditate, how to calm the mind and things. Um, I can't assume since they increased birth me if I'm wrong. You've never taught anyone meditation and the first time that they sat, they reached samadhi. I can't imagine that happens often. Oh yeah, he taught me. Exception being general. That's right, okay, okay. So uh, all exceptions uh, um, aside, not, it, it's generally something that we have to, um, uh, have to learn how to become comfortable with. Whether that is a, a particular posture, how your breath works, where your what your mind is doing, the pillars of a meditation practice, um, and, and and yet even in setting and and how you develop a fami familiarity with your practice, all um, has its roots in being able to have some means of comfort, some means of familiarity and ease in the act of meditation. Because then your mind doesn't necessarily spend as much time in how do I do this, but now can really focus on how do I clear the mind? How do I calm the mind? If you're not having to think of, man, how do I sit comfortably? Now your meditation is just that. That's, and that may not be as fruitful. <laughs> and so 
when ailments arise, it can really be jarring to one's practice. And especially if we have to make changes to how we sit. But what I would say is, um, and, and you'll see in, on the, the handout, um, there is a kind of right way of meditating. Um, and, and this has been, it, it was taught to me by Monshu Sensei. Um, Monshu Sensei was taught by Shishima Sensei, who was taught by his Sensei, et cetera, et cetera. It's been passed down how we do these things. And so typically, um, you know, it, it tends to be hard and fast in order to be the most fruitful, but it is certainly not the end all be all based on what we bring into our meditation practice. We, we can come into a meditation practice with plenty of ailments to start off. And so we have to make accommodations. Um, however, um, at least to give a, a background as to um, why we sit in a particular way. Um, these are at least three basic ways. Um, you'll see the two first are, are in seiza, which is the heels folded in underneath the, the buttocks. Um, the third there, the second position being a chair, and third being seating. Now, the one you don't see here is standing, um, but we could talk about that. Um, but this is generally uh, um, the kind of main postures that you might see. Notice I don't have laying down here, <clears throat> John. Um, it, particularly in Tendai, we, we, do not, we do not do any laying down meditation. Is that true? No, no laying down meditation. Um, and so um, mostly because snoring ensues. But um, notice here that even in, even in a Seiza type of situation, they're having some assistance in a cushion underneath their buttocks or a stool over their heels. This is just a way to lift the buttocks off of the heels and so that the feet don't fall asleep with the knees fully bent. Um, in the chair, you'll see it's very, it, same thing, 90 degree angle in the, in the hip, 90 degree angle in the knee, um, and a straight back. So same, and all the, along the top row there, you'll see a very straight back and ears over shoulders. This is very important. Um, and then on the bottom there, you'll see just three different foot positionings. One is full lotus, one's half lotus, one's Burmese. Burmese, um, or what is it called? Sukha asana. <laughs> um, and so Sukha asana being um, that the both legs are laying flat on the floor. Um, so uh, even within this, um, in the next slide here, you can start to see just the minor change in posture. Um, if if we take um, if we take this one previously, notice here there are three points of contact in any of these positions, um, whether it's the buttocks and two knees or the buttocks and, and um, two feet. And this this for the the bottom half of the body is really important. Um, this provides the foundation. It's kind of a tripod, um, and once the so the basis is solid and and and. Um, uh, firm in itself, then you can help support the upper body. Now, what happens with a lot of the upper body is then uh, we tend to slouch. And this is by a factor of like computering all day or in our nine to five desk jobs, it, we inevitably will slouch. But in the first picture, you'll see um, that really puts, as soon as our head comes in front of our shoulders, we have to really use our mid back um, as a way to help hold up the head to prevent it from flopping down. So that puts a lot of strain on those muscles. The second one there um, is interesting. I don't love the way it corrects because I wouldn't necessarily say get a bigger cushion, um, but the, the cushion there um, is distinctive because I would put this in both a chair category and cushion category, which is to say, if you sit on the cushion, then it, it can occlude a lot of the blood flow through the hamstring. And so you're actually coming at a 45 degree angle at the cushion. You're not sitting on the cushion. Um, and so that, that way that the, the um, hamstring isn't being um, pinched. So it's really just your tailbone. Now in a chair, this is important because um, as I sit in this one, this one's nice and low for me, but it also means that my knees are now above my hips. And that is distinctively difficult in meditation. And I'll explain that. But we want generally, we don't want to be seated all the way in the back of the chair because same thing, and, and, and especially for um, shorties, short legs, um, 
you you if your feet are dangling now your hamstrings are up. We you need a solid um, your feet on the floor. Sitting at the edge of the seat now you're not having as much of this the chair seat cutting into your legs. Um, and so it also allows you to um, if you can drop knees and so uh, the whole purpose of a cushion is to be able to get knees below hips. You see that in the fourth uh, the fourth picture there, bottom right. Um, the knees are uh, at the same level. And so what happens is in a bucket seat in a car, if you ever notice, if your knees are up high, your pelvis rotates backwards. And now my tailbone is like, or my sacrum is pointing um, towards the back. And with that, my, my whole torso caves. If I can get my knees below hips, I can at least allow for the fact that my hips are going to open upwards. So that's that little, what that little sign is. See, the knees are going down in the green, uh, the, bottom, the most bottom right of the picture. The knees are lower so that the hips can rotate and the lumbar, the low back, can come forward. Now, this isn't exaggerated. <laughs> right? We don't like want the little sway back. <clears throat> but upright. Because if the, if the spine can sit over the foundation, then we, our torso and, and rib cage is upright. That means we can roll our shoulders back. When we roll our shoulders back, we can stack the head. When it's all stacked over that foundation, you're using less musculature to hold it up. The weight is coming straight down. You're not having to, it's not pitched left or right, front or back. So you're not holding it up. So in this relaxed position, the, then this is where my voodoo hat comes on. It's about energy flow. Whether you, and, I, and energy is a misnomer, but chi, chi. Okay. If things are relaxed, energy flows. This is what Tai Chi and Qigong are trying to do. It's the even and easy flow of energy throughout the body. If you sit like this, you're a kinked hose. The hose is bent and it's going through a, a smaller, it, um, it's more restricted. So as, if, as soon as you can open things and relax musculature as much as possible, things will flow even and easily. Now, East Asian medicine, this is, this is the basis for symptoms. Ailments is the improper or um, stuck flow of energy in our body. So improper posture can cause pain. Okay. 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 <laughs> so that's at least, a, uh, and I should say, the, this kind of furthers that same um, image, what I was describing. The rotation of the pelvis is really important because then now all of a sudden now your feet can be firmly planted in that in that picture on the right. Uh, the rotate the, the hips are rotated. Um, the chest is not pushed out but brought down. Right shoulders are rolled back, and the back of the head is extended towards the ceiling. And in this way, now our arms can relax. Our head can relax. It's standing over a pillow. And the least amount of tension means the better flow of energy. I know for myself, if I start to sit like this, energy comes up into my head and it can't come back down. I get anxiety, I get anger, I get headaches, worry, overthinking, etc. Send it down. The same energy that's flowing through your body is the same energy flowing through your mind. If it is stuck somewhere, it's going to impact both. Mind body. They're not different energies, different keys, different chi. Okay. So <clears throat> at least within that, um, within that, oh, okay, we're getting, getting too far. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> within, within getting into that, that idea of what is proper posture, at least it, it, it helps to paint a picture that. We may not be able to do that. Even starting our meditation practice, we may not be able to do that. But the principle behind why we try to sit that way is because we're trying to find comfort and ease muscularly, physically, 
neurologically, etc. All of this helps to help quiet the mind. Um, and once you embody that, that posture, now it, you fall back onto that routine more and more. Now you can actually have a more fruitful meditation because it's something familiar that you can let go into. However, I would really emphasize the routine part. And I might say rit ritual part of it because when, you know, I have my own routines. I wake up in the morning, I go down and make my coffee. I open the cupboard and get, grab the cup. If the coffee ain't there, I'm going to notice. Hopefully, it's just in the next cupboard. And I make the small change. I get the coffee, right? And I move on. But I notice the change. You know, and so because it's done daily, any slight change, any slight difference, you're going to notice it. And hopefully, the change is in the next cupboard and not have to go to the grocery store. <laughs> right? Right? And that, that I find is, um, for me, a, a huge source of introspection is that daily involvement. Man, today is a lot more like a lot more uncomfortable than yesterday. Huh? That's interesting. And you move on. But it tells me, oh, you know, man, I'm really tight today. I better spend a little extra time. Whatever. And so it's a way to take stock. It's a way to compare how you, how, like how you are today, because that may be different. Now, not to compare meditative states or meditative meditations, but just taking it taking an ass assessment of where things are, mentally, physically. But that ritual is important to do that. <laughs> so, you know, when we're talking about physical ailments, I have to assume most people know that they're in pain. However, you know, I might argue that um, ailment can also be discomfort, tension, my, my minor stuff. And it's great to be able to notice that before it becomes pain. And being able to notice it quicker um, might help to mitigate the amount of change that one needs to do to a med meditation practice. So as one, you know, yes, we have to make, the, make accommodations to, as, to our ailments that we bring into a meditative practice. But if we continue a meditation practice, I guarantee you, there's going to be something that comes up that's going to impact the way that the, the how you meditate, you know. Um, and so knowing how to um, knowing how noticing things coming up before they get rageful is important. Um, because now you're only having to make smaller changes to that routine and therefore not as unfamiliar when you are relying on your meditation. A lot of people uh, really find solace in a meditative practice. If you take that away from them, that can be really upsetting and, and actually impact mental health and a whole host of different things. <clears throat> it may just be their simple way to decompress. You take that away and that, that's difficult for a lot of people. But so is, you know, you know relying on, on a certain way of meditating or a certain place. I mean, uh, has anyone meditated somewhere else in their house and, and notice how different that feels? Small changes can have a huge impact. So all I would say is, is hopefully being able to notice things um, means that you're, you're making the smaller changes uh, as they happen rather than waiting for it to really be broken. But that also means you have to notice now take stock. Now kind of assess. You have to spend time with it a little bit. How much pain? Where's the pain? What causes the pain? What's better? What's worse? A little exploration. Be involved in your own health. It's nice. You know? <clears throat> because then, then you can kind of, it, it helps to narrow down what really is going to help. And, and, and meanwhile, Teachers help too. Again, you know, uh, if anyone's been doing a meditative practice, they, they've, they've dealt with this. Trust, trust that. You know, they can help make appropriate. You know, once you've taken 
an assessment of things. Once you kind of have a sense of, man, this is really tough. Okay, go find some help. Get some guidance. There ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, I think the other part is uh, when we are deciding to make certain changes, uh, it, it, it helps to um, have it not be so divergent. So for example, uh, since I, could I use you as an example? Uh, when, I, when I first came here 20 years ago or so, um, you were only just started using a, a, a Zafu on the, the Laihan. The Laihan is the raised um, bench, uh, or raised platform in front of the altar. So during service, you, he would use a um, Zafu cushion up on its edge, like we saw in Seiza, to help uh, it help his knees. He's a lifetime runner and years of Seiza. <laughs> knees will be compromised. Now, you made that small change. He also spent time in the Hondo practicing how to do it. So that when it came to a Wednesday night, it wasn't unfamiliar. It wasn't difficult. It, it was at least it had a bit more. Flow. Um, and so now that lasted 15, 20 years. Right. You know, small little change. Now, granted, things moved on. He's led a little bit more life and his knees got a little worse. Okay. Another little change. Now, this one a little bigger. He had to go to a chair. Okay. No huge difference, but in how it feels and how it felt, maybe. Right. Same thing, went back to practicing. You might have to move the, the tables a little bit. I might have to, but the point is the ritual didn't change. How he went about it, maybe. Did it take a little bit of time to get familiar, re-familiarized with it? Yep. Did that maybe impact his doing the service during those few several times? Probably. Is it now? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of what I, uh, I'm going with here, is that hopefully the, the changes to how we physically meditate don't have to be tremendous. But if they do, it just takes a little longer to acclimate. So, yeah. And this is why I wanted to also elucidate like how uh, the, the, the quote unquote proper way of meditation, um, because at least returning to that intention, returning to that kind of purpose of what the meditation is, now you can make accommodation within that scope, within that field of perspective. <clears throat> and the, the right way is going to be what it is for your body. Hopefully, you know, but if gen in general, if you are able to sit in a way that is with some ease, comfort, um, but with a sense of not just like, <laughs> you know, um, because that, that at least that, um, depending on the various ailments, with that, with those kind of underlying foundations in mind, you can make the appropriate modifications hopefully and again if not you always have other people you can turn to for those for those things um i'll, I'll pause here um and and go back to that wonderful picture of the gibbon is it gibbon no the uh, lemur. lemur thank you lemur <laughs> it's a leaping lemur leaping lemur and and i thought it was just so good that From Madagascar. Meditating there. um but particularly here I, i'd also ask if if there was anyone who's dealing with anything right now um, that, that they find as a physical re restriction to their meditative practice <laughs> or just general questions, comments. You, you need to unmute and, people unmute. and then put on gallery view. And, and you need the opportunity. Did you want to say anything particularly about that? Or the, the, only thing I was, the only thing I was going to say is that especially when we begin meditating, uh, and if you were sitting in, let's say, half lotus, as an example, a person may have pain in the legs, in the hips, 
uh, in the upper back. And part of that is because when, especially when we're beginning meditating, we're not accustomed to the muscles that we're using or we're using the muscles in a different way. And so sometimes we also just have to be patient and realize that the back, the legs, whatever it is, they're going to hurt for a while. And, and that's something that you just have to learn to deal with. And it will go away if after a time you find that it's just interfering with your meditation. Now you say, I'm going to have to make an accommodation, you know. And well, the other thing I would just comment on is that if you find that you can't, I mean, I used to sit in, I've gone from full lotus to half lotus. Mm -hmm. To sitting on a <laughs> sitting on the daihan to sitting on a chair, you know, over time. And that's just an accommodation to the process of my body aging and saying, that's what I've got to do. And that doesn't mean that somehow, if I'm not sitting in full lotus, mm -hmm. I'm not sitting meditation. And, and we just have to keep that in mind. And also not to let the ego get so. I'll just make a very quick vignette or a very, very quick comment that I remember years ago, we're going back now 40 years ago at Zen Mountain Monastery. And I, we had been sitting for about probably eight hours that day. And I had been sitting for maybe at a particular moment, 45 minutes. My leg was totally asleep. Both my legs were totally asleep. We get up to do Kinyan walking meditation. And I was thinking to myself, okay, got to get up, got to do walking meditation. My feet were totally asleep. My legs were out of it. I get up because my ego said, everybody's walking. I better walk. And what did I do? I broke my ankle. <laughs> I stepped on it, it buckled under. And Broke my literally broke That's my true. ankle. Keep in mind, I continued to do kin hin and all the other activities that weekend. That was just ego. <laughs> and, and, I guess. But what was really funny, I was I was in graduate school at the time, and everybody says, Oh, you broke your ankle. Was that in karate? <laughs> no, it was <laughs> 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 but but I, think, I think since it brings up a good point, which is like at the moment of noticing, you have the opportunity for choice. <laughs> you, you, either, you either pay attention to it and, and work to resolve it, or you, you, you know, kind of put it off, or you stubbornly just kind of <laughs> and ignore it. And, and, and I would say that, that if meditation is the cultivation of compassion, have a little for yourself, you know. Uh, I think I think oftentimes we kind of, uh, you know, um, I, I I often make the analogy that that um, we can't help others until we help ourselves. You know, um, it's hard for us to be there for others when when we're not there for ourselves. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but thank you, Sensei. Yes, Ishizuma Sensei. Is there anything in particular that you would you would say about all this? Oh, and I think yeah. you're muted, Sensei. Sensei, you're muted. I can't hear you. Right. Okay. Yes, as you mentioned, the uh, posture of sitting is very important. As well as, you know, exhaling, inhaling, very important, especially exhaling. <laughs> when we do it, uh, especially Horisawa Somon, uh, he was a former abbot of Sanzain Temple in Kyoto. He emphasizes exhaling, you know, uh, and the counting number, uh, you see, uh, exhaling, inhaling, one, two, three, four. But they, so odd number, one, three, five, seven. Just uh, emphasize the exhaling out completely. And when you count, count the number, only exhaling from one to 100 and repeat maybe five times or so, it will make about uh, 30 minutes. That is very adequate uh, sitting time. 
Exhaling is most emphasizing, you know, inhaling, everybody can do it without inhale, you, you shall die. And so, but exhaling is uh, exhale uh, your uh, every bad nature out through your mouth uh, and uh, you inhale very clean air through nose. So uh, I think uh, exhaling is also very important as, as well as, you know, posture itself. And uh, we have learned uh, how to sit in meditation by Shikan Shamata Vipassana of Tendai GE. And so maybe you can refer to maybe uh, balance of the sitting. And I think uh, chapter four, uh, we have learned, I think. So I think, uh, yeah, posture is, of course, very important as well as uh, <clears throat> inhale and exhale is mo more important. That is my comment. Thank you so much, Sensei. Um, are there any questions or comments or thoughts? <laughs> Excuse me. Just one comment, and this is actually from this is from a motorcycle book called "Ride the Extra Mile." For people like me who do whole days on the bike, and it was referring back to a study about minor discomforts, not pain, and it showed that a minor discomfort was physically and mentally tiring, and that as it went on, your ability to maintain focus was going away. So the minor discomfort that you say, well, I can get through this, it's not a problem. In the long run, it is cutting down your ability to remain focused and you might say mindful time, even though you yourself don't think you're thinking of that little burn in your head. It is there and it is working on you. Yes, the, it, and, and, and it can become, even, even those little guys can become very, um, what I call mentally consuming, hmm? you know, um, and which obviously doesn't leave a whole lot of cognitive bandwidth for, you know, yeah, focusing on meditation or whatever it may be. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, was, I was going to say something and then I thought better of it. I was going to say that you can make accommodations, uh, but if you consider full lotus to be like, okay, that you can't really go beyond that or do better than that. But if you if you do make accommodations, you could check it out after a while and see if maybe you are able to achieve mm. one of it. But then again, mm. eh, why, you know, what I don't know. See what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like, yeah. Why is it why would it why again would it I think it? I think it's hard to hard to equate is full lotus better. Well, yeah, exactly. That's why I uh, well, it's 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 recommended, so there must be certainly a reason. I don't think we have anyone here who that. does it. Oh, one person. We do. Order. Do. But it you should change. watch how he does it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'm doing it correctly. <laughs> he gets one angle on top of the. Good. Well, that's my question. How? Where should the ankles be? When you're sitting in. Oh, you're gonna make me do this. Yeah, come on. Um, uh, uh, um, um, some, I, my, mine land on my quads. Yeah. There you go. I mean, you know, you can't come out, yeah. but then you risk this. Well, yeah. well, that's my question. I can keep it in that position, but after a while, it's the ankles right here. Mm -hmm. When you said it, you can take your thumbs and just like, no, I'm not doing it there. I'm doing it. Here. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's ankles yeah. more than here. But it's, <laughs> yeah, what is it doing for It's not yeah. painful for 24 minutes. Mm -hmm. If I try to go beyond that, it depends how much beyond that. But even then, it takes, what, a minute to just rub the ankles sure. and, you know, I try not to break them. Uh, what, what, I, what, I, what I will say, what I will say, and I, and I, and I, I apologize, this is my acupuncture hat on, but uh, kind of apropos to what David was saying, things start small. For example, uh, um, you may experience low back pain, but it doesn't come out of nowhere. 
you might have a threshold of pain and all of a sudden you've crossed, right? But that doesn't mean that you've had years of just tension, 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 tension. And then all of a sudden, pain, right? So I wouldn't say that like, it, you know, luckily it re relieves itself and, and, it, and it moves on. That may not be the case in five years. That's all. I mean, you're, you know what I mean, right? It's like, so, so I guess, it, you know, you can pay attention to it. It's, it's giving you its little like, hey, well, you know. Can I just make a comment? Because you were saying, well, full lotus is the best. And, well, no, I, I mean, I mean, yeah. you're saying if, it, if that's indicating, well, that's. Yeah. I would say. And, and, I, and I have to say that full lotus is the best for those who can do who it. Who can do it. Yeah, thank you. Then. Half Lotus is the best for those that can do that. Yeah. And then Burmese, if that's the way you do it. Remember the Burmese position, nobody does full Lotus. Mm -hmm. In Tibetan tradition, yeah. nobody, nobody does full Lotus. Okay. And so what happens is the posture is important. Right. Where you put the legs is less right. important. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The posture, the back straight, so that the, the, the feet, Go, the key goes through the body straight right. is what is important. Mm -hmm. Full lotus was used because it was a stable position. Mm -hmm. That's why it was used. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're sitting in a chair properly, that's the stable position. Mm -hmm. As long as the spine is straight, then the kundalini can flow through the body correctly. The kundalini is not flowing. It, you're not. You're not improving. The kundalini flow, whether you're in full lotus, half lotus, right, whatever it might happen to be, exactly. or sitting in season. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think that that's the important yeah. thing to keep in mind. Being stable is what is important. Right. So you're not finding yourself adjusting yourself. You're not going left or right, front or back. So the important point is the posture is is correct. Mm -hmm. And then the breath, as Ichishima Sensei said, combine that with the breath. Now you're in an optimum position for the mind to follow. Mm -hmm. If the posture is not correct, if the breathing is not correct, mm -hmm. the mind is not going to work right. well. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. And, and breathing may be physically more difficult. And mm -hmm. breathing, you know, breathing is definitely is, more physically yeah. difficult if the posture is not correct. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it's not thought badly, uh, one could switch legs, yes. I have a question. It's because it's an esoteric perspective of which leg is on which leg, but we don't need to we don't, get yeah. into that. So for all intents and purposes, yeah. but, yes. but for all intents and purposes, if you, if so you have hard. one leg up and the other leg down, halfway through the meditation, you want to switch it, wow. go ahead and do it. Great. Mushi, you had your hand up. Yeah, I have a question about breathing. Hmm. Itoshima Sensei suggests that we count to a hundred five times during Shamanta. And is that what we're doing? No. That's one way. That's one way, but that's okay. not necessarily the only way. Okay. Um, and, and that's um he was referencing a Hodisawa sensei, um, who who is at this point um is he still alive? Is he, yes, yes, so he he's he's Tendai Ajani of, he's of, an Ajani. of uh, Shikam. Um, um, he's, so anyway, the, a lot of what Ishima Sensei was referencing. And the, was and the Shoshikan makes reference to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah, please. You were talking about how a minor discomfort can raise the level of pain and, and struck your focus. Mm. Yeah, right? can Right. I always thought that minor discomfort was something that you could observe the way we say, if a thought enters your mind, mm -hmm. observe it and let it go. Mm -hmm. So that you just observe the discomfort and let it go. And so mm -hmm. as long as, you know, when you complete your meditation and stand up, if there's no more discomfort, mm -hmm. you, then that was okay. But if the pain lingers after mm -hmm. you finish the meditation, mm -hmm. then you went too far. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the distinction is um, is level of focus. How distracting is it? Can you sit through it? Um, it you know, I, I don't like. There are meditations where meditations that you 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 explore pain. I, I, I wouldn't suggest.
with those. That's right. Um, and and so um, it, I find personally um, that you you can explore discomfort and in fact help to find the root of it and maybe hopefully find the thing that helps it ameliorate by exploring it. Um, not everyone likes to do that, but if it is if you are able. Um, I, I, I like body skin. I like diving into it, but I'm also an anatomy geek. So, uh, you know, that for me, it helps me focus sometimes, like you're saying. So it just depends on how are you using it? Because, um, thank you. Um, because I think that that's, uh, other, I wouldn't want it to become you just sitting there thinking about your pain. That's not meditation, right? Possibly figuring out, like, if I, if, you know, um, ow, my knee hit hurts all of a sudden while I'm sitting half lotus, let's say. Can I just go to a uh, Burmese style? And that relieves the pain. What, that's so interesting. What's going on? You know, and now I'm, I'm sending my consciousness down through that knee. And I'm, but I've, I've alleviated the discomfort. I can still explore it, right? But it's not... I'm not just sitting there like, ow, 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 right? So I, I think minor discomfort, sure, okay? And, ho and again, I like people being proactive in their own health, please. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how, how you're using it to focus or how, what you're actually doing in that meditation, that, that's all I would put that, you know, juxtaposition. Um, does that make sense? I have a question. So you have your coffee and then you meditate or you <laughs> meditate while you're drinking your coffee? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> 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 we, we always do our coffee, coffee first. first. <laughs> yeah, coffee first and then... But, I, then. you know, that's your practice. That's what? That's your practice. Okay. I mean, some people meditate at night because it helps them wind down from the day. Uh... It depends. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. have coffee first. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I, don't I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously if we were at a monastery, that might be a little different, but right. lucky for you, you know? <laughs> no, but, but just just keep in mind that tea was mm -hmm. used in China and brought to Japan for the first meditation of the day to keep the people awake. Mm -hmm. That's why tea was originally brought to Japan from China. Wow was for the first meditation of the day. Right. That's usually three, four, five in the morning, but oh, well, okay. two, two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mushin. Yeah, I remember getting uh, instruction early on that one should focus on the discomfort that you're experiencing and, uh, and watch what happens. Yeah, it just depending on the discomfort. That's the, the, that is part of the practice. Yeah, that, that, that is what I was it, taught. It can be. It can be. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I guess all I'm saying is um, that may not be for everyone. <laughs> um, and and yeah, because uh, yeah, so, people people you know as soon as they're uncomfortable they just move, and that's well, really not a great thing to do. It. it I think it depends on the particular situation. You know, I, I think what, what's the other um, that we typically see um, uh, in 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 because we see that type of style a lot of times in um, in many practitioners of Americanized Soto and Rinzai Zen, where it's it's I can sit through anything, ha ha, you know, um, and you know, and so it's the stoicism, the, the ego that the Sensei was mentioning. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a, uh, how would I call it? A, yes, a competition or this rite of passage or something you need to endure in order to. In the next, in the next uh, Winter Olympics, it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. 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 Put on a uh, on those generally practicing meditation. Um, okay. We are going to move right along. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah.
and uh, and I will I will be taking over in the Zoom session. I'll be going now. Thank you so much, everyone. The pain getting out. Of this Just chair. excuse the <laughs> small little interlude here. This evening, well, often I do a Dharma talk, and then at the very end, I provide a quote of the week. And this week, I'm going to start with the quote first. Just as the individual is not alone in the group, nor anyone in society alone among the others, so man is not alone in the universe. And this quote is by the 20th century French ethnologist and social anthropologist, Claude Levi Strauss. And Levi Strauss lived from the ages of eight, of, excuse me, six to 10. He lived with his maternal grandfather, who was actually a rabbi in the synagogue of Versailles. Despite his religious environment early on, Claude Levi Strauss was an atheist and an agnostic, as he stated on numerous occasions. How are we therefore supposed to understand this statement, especially when the last portion of it is, so man is not alone in the universe? Let's explore this a little bit further. It's important to note that he also wrote, the secular civilized often consider them, often consider the concepts of life and death to be polar, dualistic. Primitive cultures often see them as aspects of a single condition, the condition of existence. Stanley Diamond, another anthropologist, commented on Levi Strauss, wrote that Levi Strauss did not reach such a conclusion by inductive reasoning, but simply by working backwards from evidence to the a priori mediated concepts of life. In other words, he was expressing a Buddhist concept, though I suspect he was not aware of the similarities of his view and the Buddhist canon. We often confuse the idea of not being alone in the universe with the proposition that there was a God in the Judeo-Christian sense, because this presumes an eternal self. From a Buddhist orientation, we conceive the individual as a collection of causations which are manifest in, as Dogen referred to it, as a bag of bones, this corporeal body, or a finite period. This mortal coil ceases to be dif a different set of causes and conditions. When one person dies, that self, provisionally, dies along with it. However, the causes and conditions continue on from the previous person to a next person. What we do not see, what we cannot test the existence of or measure is a matrix of consciousness, which is the underlying condition of the universe itself. This is now being explored by physicists, and it's not unlike the dark matter which physicists posit, a hypothetical form of matter through thought to account for approximately 85% of the matter of the universe. And by the way, we can't prove dark matter, and yet we use it all the time. Physicists think the dark matter is abundant in the universe and has had a strong influence on its structure and evolution. And much like Claude Levi Strauss, they are simply working backwards from the evidence that to the a priori mediated concepts of the universe. We see evidence of this matrix of consciousness in fungi and other life forms that have been documented, well documented. And I would suggest the film Fantastic Fungi. If you haven't seen it, make sure that you do. Just type in, do a search on Fantastic Fungi. You'll find it. Read it. 
or not read it, but, but view it. A person who is ideologically, religiously an atheist see themselves as alone in the universe because they see the self in a confined sense without the possibility of larger physical forces that physicists propose, forces being present in the known universe. As Claude Levi Strauss alluded to, the notion of being alone in the universe is a misunderstanding of the nature of existence. We are not alone in the universe unless we are only able to understand the nature of reality in a dualistic fashion. Svaha. And I will move us along, if you'll bear with me for a moment. 